The Apostle John was given a vision of heaven opened and the glory to come and he saw the sky vanishing like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the cave and among the rocks of the mountains calling to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come, and who can stand? We're going to begin by singing hymn number 480. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. And our subject matter today in the prophet Isaiah as in John's vision here tells us something of what it means for the lamb to be crowned as Lord and as judge of all the earth number 480 
Well, as we sit, let's pray together. Forever he shall reign, and earthly princes fall before his throne, before the throne of the Lamb once slain, who is the sovereign Lord of all. Lord, what hope and what peace this great truth brings to our heart as we come before you this morning together amid a world that is full of uncertainty, of change, where great seismic forces of history are at work and where were it not for the certainty of the future that your word holds out for us, we could so easily be undone, filled with anxiety and fear, and wondering what might be and what indeed the future can hold. But how we thank you that towering above all of these earthly concerns is the throne of the Lamb in heaven, is the knowledge of the day of the Lord which will surely come indeed has begun in the great coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth as man to win for us a future, to win for us the great salvation through the judgment that is to come, that we might know even now before that day, know you as our Savior, as our Rescuer is the one whose grace and mercy can bring the forgiveness of sins which alone can cause us to stand in that coming judgment. When in your wrath, in your righteousness, you will at last cleanse this earth of all evil, including the evil that breeds such sin in the human heart. Lord, we thank you that your word is honest and true and therefore trustworthy. And unlike so often our leaders and politicians, it never sweeps evil under the carpet, never pretends things are so which are not so, but exposes the reality about this world in all its ghastliness making us face up to the reality of a world that is far from right, that is full of sorrow and sadness, full of wickedness, full of the consequences of the sins in the actions, the words of human beings that come from deep in our hearts, which we know are perpetual factories of evil and idolatry. But Lord, we thank you for the hope that your gospel brings us, that in that coming day, when all will be exposed as it truly is, there is yet hope because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done. And so we praise you, Lord, that as we gather this morning, we gather in his name and for his sake. We gather because of the great saving work that he has instituted in our human history, coming into this dark world to bring light, to bring hope, to bring the possibility of safety and of eternal life because of all that he has done in carrying away our sins forever and ever. So, Lord, we pray that this morning you would fix our eyes afresh upon him, our great Savior, and upon his marvelous salvation. That you would, through your word, teach us the reality we must not shun or shy away from about this world and about that coming day when all will be put right through the destruction of all that is wrong. Reorient our minds and our hearts, we ask. We might live our daily light, lives 
guided by that light, no longer in darkness, but walking in the light of your truth and also of your mercy and the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, equip us, enable us as your people to be people of the light, as your church to be what you've called us to be, a pillar and a buttress of truth, that in this dark world there may be a witness to the light of glory in Jesus Christ our Savior. So, Lord, help us, we pray, as we come this morning, each one of us from different backgrounds, different situations, some of us feeling very frail and fragile, some of us very, very conscious of the need for renewal and assurance in our hearts of your love for us and of your forgiving grace. Some of us perhaps here this morning feeling as a fraud, feeling a hypocrite to even come into the place called by your name because of what we know that we are. But Lord, to each of us we pray as your word searches our hearts you would shine the light of your truth deep within us to cleanse that which is wrong, to bring us the repentance that we need, and also to bring us the assurance of your great saving love for us. So strengthen us, Lord, we pray. Renew our hearts afresh by your Holy Spirit and lead us again in this coming week that our faltering steps may, guided by your sure footsteps, lead us safely and truly in the way everlasting. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to you this morning on this uh, very chilly morning. It's uh, good to see you, and uh, if you are visiting with us here for the first time at the Tron Church, then uh, let me welcome you very particularly. Whether you're here and I can see you, or whether you're uh, downstairs in one of the rooms, I hope that you can see and hear us, and uh, feel uh, very much welcome among us. After the service, hopefully there's a chance to meet and greet one another, and uh, to encourage one another in the Lord. Can I draw your attention to these yellow sheets that you have, uh, I think, on your seats? They have a number of notices in them for the coming week. Uh, let me just first of all uh, remind you of our evening services. We meet uh, twice more today in uh, uh, at different places at 4.30 in the congregation down at Queen's Park and then at 6.30 again here uh, in Bath Street. For those of you who are coming here this evening, uh, do note that tonight is the uh, switching on ceremony of the Christmas lights in George Square. And uh, that therefore means that the time will be very busy, it'll be harder to get parked, and uh, the traffic will no doubt be a little worse than usual, so do come early and uh, make sure that you're uh, able to be here. A um, couple of other things you'll see on the bottom right-hand corner, that after this evening's service here at Bath Street, there's a student uh, supper taking place uh, down in the wines, so uh, do come along and uh, join in with that if you're students, and uh, we'd love to, uh, to welcome you to that. There are lots of other notices there about things going on this week, including all the small group ministries. If you're, if you're not yet involved in one of our small group Bible studies, do let me encourage you to, uh, to think about that. Uh, we're always keen to encourage people to be involved in uh, one of these ministries beyond uh, the larger groups on Sundays and Wednesdays and so on. And uh, we'd love to help you to do that if there's uh, a group that uh, would suit you. Do speak to me or speak to one of the, the folks on duty, somebody with a badge. I'd be happy to tell you more about that. There are groups that meet around the city as well as here in this building and uh, at different times of the week and different places. So uh, something for everybody, we hope. And uh, I would encourage you to think about that. Lastly, you'll see there there's an insert again about our Christmas book for this year. Uh, do uh, consider getting one or two or more of these. They're particularly designed to encourage you in, uh, in your thinking as we prepare ourselves for Christmas this year and think of the, the joy of incarnation. But they're particularly designed as books that you can give to friends or family uh, who you would like to read about the Christmas story and understand something more of the Christian gospel. So uh, they're available in the book room 
And if you buy one, you get one for a pound uh, to give away to somebody else. I don't think we can do better than that. So let me encourage you uh, in that direction. Well, this morning we have um, two baptisms. And uh, you'll remember that a few weeks ago we had a, an evening service, a joint service over at Kelvin Grove, uh, where we had a number of baptisms, but uh, two of our uh, brothers and sisters here were unable to be with us uh, on that day, and uh, so they're going to be uh, baptized here this morning. And we have Arwen and uh, Ashkan, and I'll introduce you, uh, them to you in a moment. But first of all, let me just say a little word about Uh, what it is that we're doing, what baptism uh, is all about. Maybe that uh, for some here who are new, uh, they're quite unfamiliar uh, with it. The sacrament of baptism was uh, instituted by the risen Lord Jesus Christ as he was about to ascend into heaven before his apostles. uh, He said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore you are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So it's about making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who live under the discipline, the rule of the Lord Jesus in obedience to him. Now, this was to fulfill the words spoken many times by the prophets of old. They had foretold a day when, through the Messiah, God would at last bring in his age of fulfillment for this earth. He would establish a new covenant, a covenant that is everlasting. And he would draw people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation so that they too would be brought in engrafted in to his people Israel as the true Israel of God, people who are cleansed, people renewed by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, his son. As I said, the prophets of the Old Testament in many ways, in many places, looked forward to those days. So Ezekiel spoke about that day and said, In that day, says the Lord, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. That is, in obedience to all God's commands. And so in this age of fulfillment, with the coming of the Lord Jesus, the sign of belonging to God's earthly household is no longer uh, the mark of circumcision, a mark which, uh, for its time and with good purpose, Uh, outwardly divided uh, Jew from Gentile. No, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, now neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything because as many as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whatever your background, wherever you're from, our identity is now in Christ alone who fulfills all the promises of old. It's by faith in him alone that we belong to the household of God. And so the the sacrament of baptism is thus a sign and seal of God's covenant of grace in this age of fulfillment. It's a sign of our engrafting into Christ. It's a sign of the forgiveness of our sins by the sprinkled blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sign of our regeneration, our new birth, by the pouring out of the Holy Spirit from heaven as promised. It's a sign there for our, of our adoption, of our resurrection into everlasting life. And that means that in Christian baptism, all these uh, preliminaries, all these foreshadowings, all these prophecies that occurred in all the repetitive washings, the repetitive sprinklings of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. All that these things pointed forward to have now been fulfilled and accomplished in Jesus. That's why the Apostle says in Hebrews chapter 9 that when Christ appeared, he entered once for all into the holy place. Unlike the high priest who entered again and again 
not by means of the blood of goats and calves, as in the days of old, but by means of his own blood, and therefore securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more, he says, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that blood purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's why the Apostle Peter says, Baptism now saves you. Not by removing dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. In other words, it's not our appeal to God, but baptism points us to the risen Christ's faultless appeal to God by his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. So baptism in that way preaches to us the true gospel. It tells us every time we see and participate in a baptism that everything that God has promised, he has fulfilled once and for all in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's a word that reminds us every time we see it that it is now in Christ and in Christ alone that all our hope is found. Nothing else is needed in fact, nothing else is possible. Just the grace of God poured out to us through the Holy Spirit in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his Son. And that's what this sign of pouring out of water is all about. It points us back, just as our other sacrament, the Lord's table, points us back to the fulfillment of all things in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ at the cross at Calvary where our sins were forgiven. So I'm going to uh, ask Arwen uh, and Ashkan to come and stand here before you. Arwen was uh, first brought to our church fellowship here to a live lounge event over at Kelvin Grove. Uh, earlier in the year by a work colleague, Emma Brockett, who works with her at the University of Glasgow. Arwen had some understanding of the Christian faith uh, from her late mother, but they really went to church and uh, she'd never really met other Christians. And so it was so exciting for her uh, when uh, Emma shared her faith and brought her here. And she's found being part now of a real Christian fellowship, a wonderful thing. And uh, Arwen, it's a great joy uh, that we share with you. And Ashkan, Ashkan Alekani began to uh, take an interest in Christianity in his own native Iran. He attended a house church there for several months uh, that a friend of his hosted. And through that, he began uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he had to flee from Iran. And when he came to Glasgow, he found his way here with others uh, to the Tron Church and claimed Jesus Christ as his own Lord. And for him, hearing and reading the story in the Gospels of the thief on the cross, the thieves on either side of Jesus, was a very significant thing. And he wanted to know, could it be true also for him, like for the dying thief, that his sins could be forgiven and that he could be sure of a place with the Lord Jesus in paradise? And the answer, of course, is yes. And so uh, Ashkan also has come to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and stands before you today uh, to confess his faith. So uh, Arwen and Ashkan, let me put uh, these, uh, these questions to you. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And do you repent of your sins with a humble and contrite heart? Put your trust in the mercy of God, which is in Jesus Christ alone. And let me ask you also, as you come into fellowship uh, in this church as members of our congregation here, do you promise to join regularly with your fellow Christians here on the Lord's Day? 
Do you promise to be faithful in reading the Bible and in prayer? Do you promise to give a fitting proportion of your time and talents and money for the church's work in this world? And do you promise then, depending on the grace of God, to confess Christ before men, to serve him in your daily work, and to walk in his ways all the days of your lives? And would you kneel? Ashken, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you all the days of your lives. Amen. Arwen, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and rest upon you all the days of your life. The Lord bless you both and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now let's pray together. The Lord Jesus said, if anyone come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Heavenly Father, look upon these who are now your children through the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. They have stood before us and confessed his name with love and with joy. And so we pray that you keep them faithful unto him all the days of their lives. That on the great day, the day when the Lord Jesus returns, they shall be found full of joy. And along with all of those who have longed for his appearing, will inherit with them the joy that is everlasting in the Father's house and the glory of your eternal kingdom. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, Arwen and Ashken will be uh, at the door there at the end of the service, and I'm sure many of you will want to uh, welcome them and encourage them and uh, bless them as they uh, join us on this special day. Well, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning, and you'll find that in the prophet Isaiah. And if you have one of our church Bibles... Let me just tell you, that is, I think, page 576. Page 576 uh, in our church Bible. And uh, Bob File is uh, preaching to us this morning and returning after a little while to uh, these studies in Isaiah, which we began some months ago. And we come this morning to chapters 13 and 14 which speak of this great day of the Lord that the prophets promise and all that that means. And these are solemn oracles as well as, in many ways, greatly comforting ones for the Lord's people. Isaiah 13 at verse 1, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. On a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exalting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the ends of the heavens. 
the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. The stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the meads against them, who have no regard for silver and do not light in, delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. There ostriches will dwell and there wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob, and will again choose Israel, and will set them in their own land, and sojourners will join them, and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob. And the peoples will take them, and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel will possess them in the Lord's land as male and female slaves, they will take captive those who were their captors and rule over those who oppressed them. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you, all who are leaders of the earth. It raises from their thrones all who are kings of the nations. All of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. Your pump is brought down to Sheol, the sound of your harps. The maggots are laid as a bed beneath you and worms are your covers. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit in the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. 
Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch, clothed with the slain, those who pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. May the offspring of evildoers never more be named. Prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. I will rise up against them declares the Lord of hosts and will cut off from Babylon name and remnant descendants and posterity says the Lord and I will make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction declares the Lord of hosts Amen May God bless this, his solemn word, the word of the judge of all the earth. We're going to sing now number 513, a hymn that reminds us of what it means that the kingdom of God shall at last come and fill this whole earth. Number 513, your kingdom come, O God. Your rule, O Christ, begin. Break with your iron rod the tyrannies of sin. Number 513. few moments uh, of quiet now as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work uh, are received. You might like to look over again. This passage we'll be studying shortly. 
uh, or perhaps uh, read around in the uh, chapters around that in Isaiah. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bring these offerings before you, joining them with all the giving of our fellowship here and asking that you would take them and use them, multiplying them, that the work of your church, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in this world, would be aided and helped that it might grow and be established and above all that the gospel of our Lord Jesus might be made known in every nation among every people and tribe and tongue for you have promised O oh God that the gospel should be made known and should be heard by all nations but only then the end shall come and our desire is to speed that coming, the coming of the day of your power and might, your justice and your righteousness, when all wrongs at last in this world will be righted, when all that so blights the beauty of your creation will at last be wiped away that this world might emerge in all its beauty as the home of righteousness that as a new heavens and a new earth we might at last see the glory of God filling the universe as the waters cover the sea Lord there is so much wickedness and darkness all around us in this world today so much agony so much pain physical and mental so much suffering sometimes we feel we can hardly bear another news program another report from the Middle East from some of these terrible situations in the land of Syria the city of Aleppo or in Iraq where the fighting against the Islamic State is raging so strongly so many things, Lord, that fill our hearts with grief and horror. And yet your word teaches us that all of these things have their origin deep within the human heart. Out of the heart comes speech that is filled with hate. Out of the heart comes thoughts that are full of darkness, immorality, unfaithfulness, godlessness, wickedness, deceitfulness. 
self-aggrandizement, lies, deception. So much, O oh God, that we see so vividly portrayed in its extremes being worked out in certain situations in the world is but the particular evidence in that place and time of the sinfulness that can erupt in any place and in any time from the human heart. And so, Lord, we know that the answer to this world will never be never be a new government, a new economics, a new trade deal, a new military treaty or alliance, a new peace pact among the great nations of this world. Good as these things may be, and in your mercy and in your common grace, in the institutions of governments and the rule of law and powers, these things have restrained and will, we trust, continue to restrain evil in our midst, stopping this world from becoming what otherwise it might become without these God-given restraints upon our behavior and our thinking. But we know, O oh God, that the only answer is the coming at last of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to bring his peace through the banishment of all evil, the putting down of every enemy, and above and beyond and behind every evil manifestation of man, the great power of evil himself, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So, Lord, we pray. We pray for the expansion and for the uh, power of going out of your gospel throughout all this world, through your people in every place, that we, your church, might be what you've called us to be, a pillar and buttress of truth in this world, that we might be light in the darkness, the light shining, the glory of our Heavenly Father and pointing people to the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We pray for the church all over the world and our brothers and sisters, especially in parts of the world where the danger is great to body as well as to soul and where many are persecuted physically as well as mentally and yet joyfully hold true to the gospel of Jesus and gratefully proclaim his name. We ask, Lord, for ourselves in this nation, so privileged over so many centuries, we have had so much, so many opportunities, so much freedom. The scriptures in our own languages, in multiple translations. And yet today, O oh Lord, the churches that bear your name in our nation, more often than not, siding with a secularizing culture, changing its message, seeking rather than the praise of God, which is eternal, the praise of man, which is but fleeting. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. All of those who name the name of Christ, all of those who claim to speak for him, bring a cleansing, we ask, O oh God, a re-engagement with your word, a realization of the seriousness of your gospel of grace and truth, of righteousness and salvation and judgment. We pray, Lord, for ourselves that you would keep us ever vigilant, ever thrilled to the faith once for all delivered to the saints, that we, in trusting your word, would never seek to airbrush out of it those things which challenge our sensibilities and speak of things we would rather not speak of like judgment, repentance, the warnings of what will happen if we reject your word and fail to take it seriously. We ask for ourselves as 
a church here in Glasgow, that you would keep us in the truth that is in Jesus Christ, submissive to your word, rejoicing in it in every part, and therefore taking the message with such seriousness that our whole lives in every part, in our personal life, in our home life, in our congregational lives together, that our life in every part would be shaped by the eternal truths that we find in your word. Our priorities challenged and readjusted. Our loves fueled and our commitments deepened. We pray, Lord, for every one of our congregations meeting uh, in this city today. Those at Kelvin Grove who have already met this morning ourselves here this morning and also this evening, those who meet this afternoon at Queen's Park and the Farsi congregation also meeting in this building this evening and not forgetting those who also gather in the Tronet II congregation uh, alternate weeks. We thank you, Lord, that in these several gatherings, six or seven different congregations, yet working together to make Jesus Christ known in this city, we ask that you would bless our efforts. Help us in our weakness. Grant us, Lord, your enabling, your help, your trusting. That we might find ourselves faithful. And that you might use, even such as we are, with all our lacks, with all our weaknesses. But that the power of Christ might be found in our midst that all who come among us may know that they've been in the presence of a living God, a speaking God, a God of power and might. We think ahead, Lord, to the coming Christmas season at every opportunity presented to us therein, thanking you that this is a time when people will and enjoy coming to church to sing carols, to hear familiar readings. We pray, Lord, that we would not squander the opportunities you give us that in every one of our particular carol services, whether at Queen's Park or here or Kelvin Grove, you would give each one of us a burden of prayer, even now for those that we would love to bring, those we will ask, those that we long to hear the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to use every opportunity we have in the written word, like these books, in the spoken word, in the services we have, in everything that you give to us, that we should make Jesus Christ known. And help us to know, Lord, that in doing that, we are bringing something more valuable than anything else in the world to this fallen society of ours. The glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus, the pearl of great price above any other gift that we could give to our loved ones to our friends, our neighbors, our workmates. So, Lord, as we come to your word now, we ask that you would find our hearts open, ready, receptive. Speak to us, we pray. Open our hearts and fill us with the joy of Jesus Christ, with the solemnity of the Lamb who was slain, with the expectancy of the promise of the future and with a determination to live now, every day, in the light of the coming glory. So hear us, Lord, and draw near to us, we ask, because we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. We sing then as we come to God's Word the prayer that we find at number 527 in our blue books. Spirit of God, our hearts inspire and let us thine influence prove. Number 527.
could I ask you to turn again, please, to the passage that was read on page 576. As you're doing so, let's have a moment of prayer. Father, I pray that you will take my words and all their limitation, that you will use them faithfully to unfold the written word, and so lead us to the living word, the Lord Christ himself, in whose name we pray. Amen. On the 30th of April, 1945, Adolf Hitler, in his bunker deep in Berlin, took his own life, and the Nazi regime came to an end. Some weeks later, the great preacher-theologian Helmut Tillicke preached in one of the Berlin churches on what he called Hitler's text. This is what he read. He read chapter 14, verse 16 of Isaiah. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home. Tilika had no doubt whatever that this passage from Isaiah was not just for Isaiah's own day, it was for his day as well. Seventy years have passed since then, but who can doubt the message is still as relevant and powerful as ever? Surely when historians look back on the year 2016, they will see it as a year of fundamental change. Six months ago, this country voted to leave the European Union. It will be many years before the consequences of that are worked out. And the election of Mr. Donald Trump as President of the United States creates a great sense of uncertainty flexing of Russia's muscles, the Islamic State, all of the, the refugee crisis, all of these huge events are making people wonder, are making people worried. Where is history going? Where is the world going? And that's why I've called this sermon today, taking the words from John's letter, the world passes away. John uses world there, not in the sense of the world of human beings particularly, not of the accomplishments and achievements of the world, but of the world order as opposed to God. Babylon, the great city of the world, and in the book of Revelation we find that Babylon becomes a symbol of all regimes, all world systems that are opposed to God. And that's why that's the way we were going to look at this. The world passes away. Now, you should have on your, on your seats one of those little sheets called Finding Our Way in Isaiah. Now, trying to summarize Isaiah on a side of A5 is a futile attempt. Some of you may have come across the book 1066 and all that, which contains gems such as sum up the career of Napoleon Bonaparte using no more than 10 words. Well, trying to put Isaiah on a side of A5 is rather like that. But it may be of some help, particularly look at the structure of the, the last point there. Isaiah, we're coming to the second major section of Isaiah, the God and the Nations, chapters 13 to 27. It's no accident at all that these are sandwiched between two kings of Isaiah's time who were faced with great international crisis. One of them, Ahaz, failed to trust God and trusted in political alliances instead. Isaiah said to him, if you do not stand firm in faith, you will not stand at all. And then at the other end, 30 years later, his faithful son, King Hezekiah, faced with a much greater international crisis, trusts in the Lord, trusts in him to protect him against the king of Assyria. Hezekiah is to pray in chapter 37, Lord, save us from the Assyrians, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. So there's the situation. These kings, one of whom trusted in politics and military exploits, other of whom trusted in the Lord. Exactly the same situation as we face in our personal and our communal 
and in our national lives. So these oracles against the nations show the importance of the whole world. The whole world matters to God. After all, that was the promise to Abraham back in Genesis 12. In you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then in the, in the various prophets, we have these long sections of oracles among the nations. In case some of you think we're going to be in Isaiah for the next 50 years, um, I'm going to be selective here. Today we're looking at Babylon. In a fortnight's time, we'll look at the other superpower, Egypt, and use these to represent um, the, the other oracles. Not that there's nothing to learn in them, but one of the, one of the principles we've always advocated in Cornhill is that you don't preach the, every part of the Bible in the same way. So by looking at Babylon and Egypt, I hope we'll get the message of what God is doing in the world and what God will do in the world. In the lifetime of everybody here, after all, God will still be on the throne when the youngest people in this room come to the end of their lives, unless the Lord has returned before them. So this is a hugely important message for today. What is God doing in the world? What's he up to? And the, the, our passage, long passage, falls into three unequal parts. The first, the first part, the judgment on Babylon, chapter 13, and then the judgment on the king of Babylon, chapter 14, verses 3 to 23. And in between is this little section, these two sections of judgment, and in between, a pivot on which the whole passage revolves about mercy, about forgiveness, about repentance. So let's look at, the, let's look at our passage then. First of all, the Lord judges pride. That is what chapter 13 is about. The, or, the oracle which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Notice Isaiah is not a political commentator. He's received a message from the Lord about Babylon, about the world. The origins of Babylon go back to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Let us build a tower whose top will reach to heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. A kind of proud self-sufficiency. And here Isaiah is looking to an event which will happen long after his death. Babylon will rise, Babylon will fall, it will be destroyed by the Medes, sometimes the Medes and the Persians. They, of course, the, the area of which our, our Iranian friends come from. This was to overthrow the Babylonian Empire. And you can read about this in the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Daniel says, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And it seems to me the key to chapter 13 is verse 11. I will punish the world for its evil, and I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. It's a very rich, very detailed passage. We won't be able to go into all the details. But let's try and look at some of the main points. What's being said here? Pride is the human condition, is it not, without the grace of God. And it's, um, and it's dramatized in this city of Babylon. And the first thing that's being said is the Lord initiates human events. <coughs> that does not mean that wars are good. That does not mean that every regime that rises is good. <coughs> Some of them are downright bad, and all of them are mixed and flawed. Well, what it does mean is that in the chaos, the apparent chaos of history, in the turmoil of events, the Lord is working his purpose out. Now, at the time Isaiah is ministering, Assyria is the dominant power. And it's interesting that after this very long oracle on Babylon, in verse 24 to 27, we have a very short oracle on Assyria. And the reason for this, Isaiah came to see that ultimately Babylon was the greater threat. Assyria would destroy the north, um, the northern kingdom, but ultimately it would be Babylon that would take Judah off into, into captivity to Babylon. And it was the greater threat. 
And so it is today. The Lord controls history. Regimes come and go. Prime ministers and presidents tread on the stage for a time, and then they're gone. And, but the Lord reigns forever. That is the point. The very heart of Israel's faith. Read the so-called enthronement psalm, Psalms 90 and following. The Lord reigns. The very heart of Israel's faith. And it is a statement of faith. It doesn't look as if the Lord is reigning at the moment, does it? It doesn't. We look at, our, we look at the news. We look at our own lives. And we have to say by faith, the Lord is reigning. But verses 7 and 8 show us what happens when human power is confronted by God's power. Verse 7, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. Both physical power, hands, and um, mental and emotional power, hearts, are impotent when they are faced with God. And humans have great gifts, great possibilities. The Bible never denies that. But without God, all these powers, all these possibilities come to nothing. They crumble. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is about, isn't it? All these things become nothing. Emptiness, futility, vanity. The Lord initiates human events. It appears puzzling and perplexing to us. But the Lord is in charge. The Lord reigns. The second thing is, the Lord will, will bring history to an end. This phrase, the day of the Lord, which occurs throughout Isaiah, occurs through all the prophets. Sometimes the days are coming, like in the great prophetic vision of the, the, of the nations coming to Zion and so on. The judgments in history point to the judgment on history. I think that is the point. These judgments in history arise and fall of regimes, the sequence of events. These are all in history, but one day will be the judgment on history, which Willie read to us at the beginning from the book of Revelation, the day when all the, the kings will bow. And verse 10 is an attack on the kind of idolatrous worship of the heavenly bodies. The stars of heaven, their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at rise and the moon will not set. It's, don't worship the heavenly bodies. They are controlled by God. God, the Lord of history, controls history. God, the creator, controls the heavenly bodies. And that's why the only security in these uncertain days is in God himself. And throughout history this has happened. Remember the determined attempt that King Herod made when Jesus was born to destroy him. And how it failed. An African poet wrote, Every Herod dies and comes to stand alone before the Lamb who sits upon the throne. And that's true of every power, every authority in this world and in the one to come. The Lord initiates human events. The Lord controls history and brings it, one day will bring it to an end. And this is focused here on the fall of Babylon, verse 19. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah, cities which God destroyed. The world passes away and all its pride, but those who do the will of God remain forever. The world is temporary. There used to be in Stratford-on-Avon a very, a very wonderful exhibition called the Elizabethan Experience, which was a, a marvellous audio-visual display of Elizabethan England, particularly based around a visit of Queen Elizabeth I to Kenilworth. Full of colour, full of light, full of movement. And then at the end... A hot, an, an eerie darkness fell. The lights died out, the music died out. The haunting words of Shakespeare's speech of the five ages, of the seven ages of man, echoed into that darkness. Sadly, that exhibition itself has gone, destroyed by the floods of some years ago. The world passes away. The Lord destroys human pride. And You'll notice here, I mean, this chapter is full of vivid imagery, human cruelty, verses 15 and 16, the atrocious cruelty of war. 
Think what we would feel if we were reading this in Aleppo this morning. You know, this, this brings home the kind of power of these passages. In the comfortable middle-class church of the West, we don't feel the power of these apocalyptic passages so much as, as those in situations of great fragility, great terror, and great cruelty. The world passes away. But then we have these little verse, these little two verses here, 14, 1 to 2. The Lord is full of mercy. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will choose again Israel. Now, like all these passages, the primary reference is to the return from exile, which you read about in the books of Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah, all of which books which have been studied and preached on in recent months. Now, in many senses, these books are very low-key. There is almost a kind of autumnal atmosphere about them. The nations are not flooding to Zion. The desert is not blossoming like the rose. Where, where are all these glorious promises? And when are they going to be fulfilled? But the point is, as we saw in these various studies, this is hugely important. If, as Malachi said, the Lord whom you wait for will suddenly return to his temple, there had to be a temple for him to return to. If the, if the exiles had not returned, if they had not, in circumstance of great difficulty, rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the city, and started again the worship which had been suspended during the exile, then there would have been a huge gap in the story. You see, these are assurances that the full promises would one day be fulfilled. That one day, as Wesley sang, joyful all you nations rise, join the triumphs of the skies. We'll be singing that, no doubt, in a few weeks' time. And it's so important we realize that at a time like this. Very, I mean, so much of the church today is in the kind of world of, of Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah. In the sense of the, in the, in the sense that where are the great promises? Where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of the desert blossoming like the rose? And just two things to notice. First of all, notice once again this Jacob-Israel parallel, which runs through the whole book and which Isaiah in particular is very fond of. Jacob is what we are by nature, proud, arrogant, deceitful, self-satisfied, whereas Israel is what God will make us. You see, Jacob, in many ways, is Babylon, just as we can so easily become Babylon as well if we allow ourselves to succumb to pride. You see, these, these oracles against the nations are all addressed to God's covenant people. Don't be like Babylon. Indeed, Revelation makes that explicit. Come out from among her and don't share in her judgments. If you share in her pride, you share in her judgments. So, Jacob, Israel, this story, Jacob reminding us to be humble, Israel reminding us to be hopeful. God take, takes us from Jacob and makes us Israel, but remember it's a process that will not be completed until glory. None of us are the fully fledged Israel. Let's remember that. And there's going to be a great reversal. The peoples will take them and the house of Israel will possess them. Rather in the song of Mary who will put down the mighty from their seats and exalt the humble. Not necessarily by captivity as such, but by conversion. After all, that's the way. That is the way God's enemies are very often humbled, isn't it? God's enemies become his friends. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The kingdom of the child of chapter 9, the kingdom of Emmanuel, the prince of peace, who is, as we sang earlier on, whose power a scepter sways. The Lord judges pride. The Lord is full of mercy. And now in verses 3 to, sorry, 4 to 23, yes, 3 to 23, the Lord judges the prince of this world. A powerful taunt song over the fall of Babylon. 
I love the commentaries of the late Alec Mateer, who went to be with the Lord just a few months ago. Unfortunately, I don't agree with him in his interpretation of this. He says that there is, this is not a picture of Satan, but a picture of human power. I think it's both. Behind every tyrant, behind every idolatrous and godless regime, stands a more sinister figure, the prince of this world. Now, he's already been given a death blow by the cross and the resurrection, but he is still to be finally defeated, which is why, even though Christ has died and risen again and ascended to heaven, things are difficult. Read Revelation 12 and 13. That is why, in some ways, things are more difficult now than they were then, because the devil has come down to earth and turned on the church and on, indeed on the rest of the world in great fury. The thing to remember about the devil is the devil hates everybody. He doesn't just hate God's people. Read the story of the fall of Babylon. It says, in him was found the blood of the saints and the martyrs, and significantly all who died on the earth. The devil wants to bring death and destruction. So behind all these, the sinister power of the, of the usurper, the battle of Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity, says the Lord, between you and the descendants of the woman. Verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? Authorized version has the rather magnificent phrase, Lucifer, son of the morning, which has entered, of course, into our thinking and into, into our literature. So you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying this is not a human being, the king of Babylon, just as Tilaka saw in the fall of Hitler, the fall of Babylon, just as you see in the fall of other godless empires and regimes, the, the fall of human tyrants, and the rejoicing over the fall of human tyrants. But... Just as God works through human beings, so Satan tries to manipulate human beings. And here we have a poetic picture, rather like a similar one in Ezekiel 28 of the Prince of Tyre, of someone, verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. This is the voice that spoke in Eden. You will be like God. In other words, he wanted human beings to suffer from the same prideful blasphemy as he did himself. The highest angel, the guardian of the throne of God, the ultimate expression of pride. You see, when humans are under the influence of the devil. Now, by the way, I'm not saying that those who are not Christians are demon-possessed. That's not what I'm saying at all. Paul says in Ephesians, God, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the children of disobedience. In other words, those who do not own allegiance to Christ, own allegiance to the usurper. They're very often good, decent, honorable people but they're, but they're in the sphere of the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And they're not following the one who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. They follow the one who exalted himself and was humbled. So you see, every tyrant, Hitler, Herod, Sennacherib, whom the Assyrian, whom Hezekiah is to face in faith later on in the book, and... And so it, is, so it is here. And the actual end of Babylon, verse 16 again, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert, overthrew its, its cities, who didn't let his prisoners go home. Sheol, the grave, judgment. There are no, there are no proudful, proudful distinctions there. The end of all world power, and it's by the direct, action of God. It's not, just, it's not just that evil peters out. Sometimes evil has a ferocious power and feeds on itself. It's that verse 22, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts. They will cut off from Babylon name and remnant, descendants and prosperity. posterity. They will make it a, 
a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water will sweep it with the ruin of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. Because every tyrant in history is what happens. So the Lord judges the prince of this world. Let's end where we began in the streets of Berlin in the, in the months following the sec end of the Second World War and the fall of the Nazi regime. A man called Gordon Rupp, who later became a distinguished Methodist preacher and professor of church history in Manchester, was in Berlin in the months following the, the downfall of Hitler. And he, he was walking through the streets on a winter morning like this, and he pa as he passed Hitler's chancellery, it was, it was then in ruins, of course, it had been destroyed. And on the wall outside, a young mother was feeding her baby. And just as Rop passed, the child threw his head back and laughed. The sun came out from behind the clouds. The child threw his head back and laughed. And so reflected Rop, another child throws his shadow over the empire of darkness. And who is that child? That is Emmanuel of chapter 7. That's the Prince of Peace, the mighty God of chapter 9. The child who will overthrow his enemies, who will establish his kingdom, and to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. The world passes away, but those who do the will of God remain forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that this assurance in the perplexing paths of life, in the difficulties and dangers that the world faces, that the nation faces, that communities face, that we face ourselves, we may indeed look beyond that to the day when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. Amen. So to our closing hymn, number 789, hymn that speaks about the fall, shattered thrones and fallen empires, but the continuing and increasing kingdom of Christ. 789, through the darkness of the ages, through the sorrows of the day, strength of weary generations, lifting hearts in hope and praise. Jesus, you have kept your promise. Number 789.
Apostle John says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. And until that time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen.